time now for the Sunday Talk. Tonight, the politics of Omar Khadr. For years, he was defended as a wrongfully imprisoned child soldier by some, called a dangerous terrorist by others. And this week, he was freed on bail. Many Canadians actually saw him for the first time, and a new image collided with the ones Canadians already know, Omar Khadr as a son of Al-Qaeda. He's a terrorist. When these guys went to camp, you know, they weren't making s'mores and learning how to tie knots. They were learning how to make bombs and kill Americans. Omar Khadr's father was an associate of Osama bin Laden. His childhood was steeped in Al-Qaeda ideology. When the U.S. invaded Afghanistan in 2002, he was shot and captured on the battlefield, accused of throwing a hand grenade that killed a U.S. soldier. Cotter was 15, the youngest detainee at the infamous Guantanamo Bay prison camp. He had like a child's mentality, you know, he's all more into his cartoons and stuff, but he's grown up in a, in a, in a man's prison. He languished. <laughs> Supporters say he was tortured. But his family's interviews with the media didn't draw sympathy for his cause. Everybody said he killed an American soldier. Big deal. In 2010, trapped in the evolving maze of Gitmo's military justice system, Cotter pled guilty to war crimes. When he came to Canada in 2012 to serve out his sentence, conservatives said he's a dangerous import. Omar Khadr is a well-known supporter of the Al-Qaeda terrorist network and a convicted terrorist. They fought to keep him behind bars. We continue uh, to vigorously defend against any attempts in court to uh, lessen his punishment for these uh, heinous acts. But now the man Canadians have been told to fear is free. Um, it might be uh, sometimes, but uh, I will prove to them that uh, I'm more than uh, what they thought of me, and I'm, uh, I'll prove to them that I'm a good person. Thank you very much. I'm joined by our panelists. Jonathan Kay is editor-in-chief at Walrus Magazine. John Moore is a talk radio host in Toronto. And Tasha Carradine is a columnist with the National Post and iPolitics. So I want to get a sense from all of you where you were before you saw him and where you are now, and, and did it change? Tasha? Um, I think it's changed for me in the sense that um, I am willing to give Omar Khadr the benefit of a doubt in the sense that he claims to be and appears to be someone who's genuinely remorseful for what he did and wants to move forward. He doesn't present as the terrorist that we were told he was in terms of his allegiance to al-Qaeda or extremism. So I would give him the benefit of a doubt for the interview he gave. That doesn't negate the fact that he did plead guilty, um, whether that was under duress, as uh, he seems to say, or not, um, but he does also take responsibility. He said um, he hopes he didn't throw that grenade, but it is highly possible that he did, and Christopher Spear is dead. So, you know, there, there is, there was an act committed. He has served a lot of time. I think we should give him the benefit of debt, like I said, and the court's decision was probably right, because the bail conditions are strong enough, I think, to deter any possibility of terrorism in the future. John? My opinion hasn't changed. A few years ago, I wrote a column that said, bring Cotter home. Uh, I think he served more than enough time for someone who was a child soldier participating in a war. He was on the wrong side. He was brainwashed by his jihadi father mm -hmm. at a tender age. Um, I think he served more than enough time for what he did. What do you think, John? Yeah, I've always, you know what, on both sides of the issue, if you look at left and right, I've always found that the right is so hardcore about this, and that ignores a lot of the legal aspects of the case. I mean, for the, you know, the fact of the matter is, actually, there was no forensic evidence, there was no uh, eyewitness testimony, uh, even prosecutors, and these are military men, were saying that his uh, trial was, was a sham. But on the left, you also have people who, honestly, it's like, do you want to marry him? I mean, there are people who are dewy-eyed and in love with Omar Khadr. Uh, I would just say that legally, I think the right thing has been done. I mean, he's been set free on bail because he's been eligible for parole for two years, uh, because he could have his charges voided in the United States, in which case you can't keep somebody behind bars for something they may be ultimately acquitted of. Uh, and just because I think, you know, in terms of international law, Canada's always been on the wrong side of this one. Well, the Harper government has taken a very hard line on, on Omar Khadr, even after that press conference this week. Here's what the Prime Minister had to say. The facts of the situation, uh, Mr. Khadr, as uh, we all know, um, pled guilty uh, to uh, very grave crimes, including murder. Our government's priority in these matters is always to make sure, first and foremost, uh, we keep in mind the protection and security of the Canadian population. Well, I'm going to have to disappoint him. I'm, I'm better than the person he thinks I am. 
there's, uh, there's nothing I can do about the past, but I hope that the future can, uh, I can do something about the future. So he, Johnny, obviously wants to change the Prime Minister's mind, sure. um, but, but Harper's taking a very a hard line. I, what's that about? Why? why oh, gosh, because you know what? He's, uh, Omar Khadr's a totem, right? He's a young Islamic terrorist who is accused of having murdered somebody in cold blood. Uh, he's been portrayed by the government as unrepentant, as a potential security threat to this day. I mean, he's certainly not a security threat. He's, he's under surveillance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that issue is set aside. But for Harper... It's such a, a, a perfect target because not only can he be tough on Cotter, but he can kick the other people around the block if they are weak on Cotter. And that is exactly the kind of hand that the Prime Minister always loves to play. Why do you think he's made this into such a big issue? Well, I think, look, if you do look at the polls, two years ago, 60% of Canadians didn't want Cotter back here. Um, there's been, because Cotter also has not had a chance to speak, I think that is big, big impact. What we've seen has been the speeches of his family, and you had a clip of that, um, the fact that his sister and his mother both uh, did, didn't think his, if his actions would have been a crime, that they were supportive of al-Qaeda. So I think that the perception a lot of people have in Canada is that they have no sympathy for him. And the prime minister has seen him as that kind of totem or that kind of symbol of terrorism and the need to protect Canadians from terrorism. It's harder to say, having seen Cotter now, that he is a threat. I think it's harder. And the prime minister seems to have backed down a bit on that in the sense that he's saying, yeah, we have to protect Canadians, but, you know, almost like let, let's move on from this. Is he still on the winning side, do you think, John? Uh, Harper? Uh, no. Uh, I think the, the the balance changed when Cotter gave that brief interview a few mm -hmm. days ago. Uh, his body language and his facial expression and what he said was just pitch perfect for people who wanted to believe that he'd actually changed his ways. And it was a welcome change from what we saw from his relatives here in Canada who, I mean, really just said some disgusting things about Canada and foreign policy and that sort of thing. And, uh, and actually, it was on the CBC first. I, when, when he was first mm -hmm. imprisoned in Guantanamo, the CBC aired a documentary. They interviewed uh, his relatives and his... His rel mother, his sister. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and his We're mother in awful. particular. So just awful. terrible, terrible things. And yeah. by the way, his father, who's now dead, was just an, an absolute world-class terrorist scumbag. And no, I mean, that's absolutely... I mean, he really was. He was the absolute worst of the worst. And among the terrible things he did was he used his own son as a 10-year-old al-Qaeda errand boy. And I think the quotation that's attributed to him in Al-Qaeda circles is that he wanted to throw his son Omar uh, into the, the, the furnace of jihad. That was one of the big moments in the news conference this week where, where he said, what would you say to your dad? And he yeah. said, I have so many questions for my sure. father. You why can't, you why can't did you take it. me there? You can't blame him because that is his, he is a product of his family. Um, that doesn't excuse necessarily what he did, but it explains a lot. And it also explains the attitude of the government because it is not simply the fear of Cotter, but the notion that he represents um, people who d reject Canada, who reject our way of life. And I think also the government did have access to interviews that were done with Cotter um, by the psychologist just the American psychologist Werner, for example, at Guantanamo, where his responses, I mean, he sounds like someone who obviously went through a hellish time there, and I think anyone would have probably responded the way he did, but it comes across, it's not completely clear, but he has rejected al-Qaeda or Islamism at those moments. And so for the government, I think they hung their hat on that too, to say he should not come back here, he should not be let out. It's been pretty easy. You, you Google Harper and Cotter, there's lots of information, but you look for the opposition response on Cotter, there's, there's very little. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, Tom Mulcair, Justin Trudeau are saying that the court had the right to make the decision, even perhaps made the right decision. But it's interesting, I think, because you've got all of these human rights groups saying that Canada's response on Cotter was, was shameful. Why, why is the opposition so muted here? Um, I'm not sure, actually, because I think that things did change. You guys just hit the nail on the head. I think it was a 42-second statement that was given by Cotter, but he looks like a young guy. He's not a bad-looking fellow. He speaks English like any other Canadian. Uh, he's very uh, marketable, if you want to put it that way. So you'd think that the opposition parties would now say, OK, wait a second, he's not the, the, the horrible creature that the Conservatives have portrayed him to be. Maybe we can change the But we don't uh, the see anyone here. rushing for any photo ops. <laughs> no, and I don't think they're going to ask him to run for them. I don't think they're going to pose with him. I do do think, though, that this will be part of a text or an issue through the election, or theme, I guess I should say, in that they will say that Omar Khadr is a symbol of what Canada has lost on the international stage in terms of coming to bat for our citizens, in terms of being on side with treaties and things like that? Yeah.
Tasha? I, I think, though, the problem is the, the, the opposition is very is not going to be holding him up as a symbol, definitely not asking him to run, because the minute <laughs> Canadians, many Canadians probably also even don't know about Omar Khadr, the full story. It's been a long time. And if they start dredging and Googling who is Omar Khadr, if Mulcair or Trudeau were to say, you know, we're going to defend this, this is great, that he's willing, they'll find out about his family. They'll find, they'll dredge up all these things that make Cotter, even though he may appear now to be very forthright, that cast uh, terrorism and all these things, it have, it, you know, cast his life in a bad light. And I think that's, in that sense, he is a mixed character and the opposition does not have a lot to gain in pushing this narrative. I think if Cotter pushes it, then you may see them jump on board, but it, I think it's up to him. It's just so interesting watching the buttons that, uh, that the Harper government is pushing mm -hmm. and the buttons that the opposition isn't pushing. Well, look, Trudeau in particular has learned that as soon as he touches any issue related to terrorism mm -hmm. or foreign policy or Islam, it's just, it's, he wants to stay away. It doesn't play to his advantage. Uh, something usually goes wrong. Also, I think Canadian politicians have a long history of just saying, hey, it's up to the courts. You know, they did that with abortion and capital punishment. Uh, it's happening now with physician-assisted suicide. Basically, any real morally contentious issue, uh, for the last couple of decades, Canadian politicians just say, hey, look, we're going to let the courts rule on this. And that's essentially what they've done with Omar Khadr. Mm -hmm. So we saw his news conference. Everyone had a reaction to it. Um, but that's week one. What do you watch for now? I mean, it's one week of freedom and lots of challenges ahead. What are you going to watch for, John? Well, if the people around him are smart, I think they'll keep him under wraps. Maybe mm -hmm. one interview and that's it. He can't be seen to be trying to franchise himself. So I think the quieter he is, the more powerful a symbol he becomes. And I think this is going to be sort of, I mean, our, like our Christine Keeler. I think 25 years from now, we'll say, whatever happened to Omar Khadr? And we'll sit down for an interview really? and say, what did he become? Yeah. What do you think, John? Look, uh, well, that's interesting conjecture. I, I, I'm not sure he'll be that obscure, but I think it's interesting. Uh, Ezra Levant predicted years ago when he wrote a book about Omar Khadr, uh, the book was hysterical in many respects, but he got one thing right. He predicted that when he came back to Canada, he would become a media darling. And I think what we're seeing now, there is a little bit of a media darling aspect about him. And I think we should remember that we should treat him as someone who did something horrible. We shouldn't treat him. He may be someone who, you know, he could change, he could become an upstanding citizen. He could reject his jihadi ideology. On the other hand, he did something terrible. We shouldn't turn him into uh, someone that we just regard uncritically as a hero. And yet you were arguing at the beginning that this was a, a horrible wrong. It was a horrible wrong to maybe put him in jail for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, however long Harper wanted to stay in jail for. But at the root of this was him throwing a grenade and killing an American soldier. I don't think it was a horrible act of terrorism. I think he was someone on a battlefield. He was someone who took the, the wrong side in a war, largely because of his father's brainwashing. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that American soldier did lose his, his life. And, you know, all the, the sunny press conferences that they have, that, sh that fact should not be forgotten. So one week out, what will you watch for next, Tasha? Well, I think if Cotter is sincere and he wants to move on with his life, he will not give a lot of sunny press conferences. I think he will want to rebuild his life on his own because the minute he does go out there, he will be pushing. Then he will be pushing his narrative. And that can go sideways, too. I think for him as a person, having survived what he survived, and it was obviously very hellish imprisonment, he would never want to go back to that place, most probably, and I think he would want to move forward. Now, if he, if he does become the, the media darling, as you say, that will actually, I think, add fuel to the fire of the government, ironically, who will say, look, um, this is just the left or the other people trying to push this agenda. I think Omar Khadr will be quiet for the time being and, if he's sincere, rebuild his life. Thanks so much. It's, uh, probably not the last time we talk about him. No. <laughs>